Section 20 of the Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pinchcliffe. The Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3. Chapter 8. The Hughes-Rebozo Investigation and Related Matters, Part 13. 10. The Issue of Use of the Money. Part A. Background. As discussed in Section 4 above, in February 1969, Charles G. Rebozo was asked by the President to contact J. Paul Getty regarding major contributions. Evidence obtained by the Senate Select Committee indicates that the President, Rebozo, Holderman, and Ehrlichman sought to establish a fund to be controlled by the White House staff rather than by the Republican National Committee. Evidence obtained by the committee indicates that Rebozo controlled funds during 1969, which he used for administration-connected costs. The committee has ascertained that pursuant to communications with John Ehrlichman, Rebozo, between April and July 1969, transmitted $1,416.18 from his fund to Kambach for payments to Caulfield and Yulasowicz. These funds originally derived from 1968 campaign contributions in the Florida Nixon for President Committee account. Rebozo has also testified that he received $150,100 in cash contributions from Howard Hughes and A. D. Davis. In the case of the Hughes funds, the committee has received evidence and testimony indicating that those funds were never transferred to the appropriate campaign officials or committees. According to CRP's records, the funds contributed by A.D. Davis were never received by the committee to re-elect the president on whose behalf Mr. Rebozo accepted them. Herbert Kambach has testified that on April 30th, 1973, Rebozo told him that Rebozo had spent some of the $100,000 received from Hughes on F. Donald Nixon, Edward Nixon, Rosemary Woods, and other individuals. In an effort to confirm or deny Kambach's testimony, the committee sought, through a series of subpoenas, to obtain financial records from Rebozo and from his Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company. Rebozo refused to produce all documents requested, thus frustrating the committee's investigation work and preventing it from obtaining necessary and relevant documents. The committee therefore found it necessary to subpoena the documents and records of third parties. In order to determine if Rebozo has made expenditures with hidden funds, the committee subpoenaed a few typical key Bispain contractors and vendors who were likely to have served either Rebozo or the President during the period in question. Time did not permit an exhaustive inquiry. This limited survey of contractors and vendors proved fruitful since it revealed that Rebozo was using four trust accounts in his attorney's name through which his funds moved. Three of these accounts are at Rebozo's bank, and Rebozo again refused to produce lawfully subpoenaed records relating to said trust accounts. Nevertheless, based on records provided by those few vendors and contractors contacted and the limited documents and re records available to the committee, a detailed analysis was prepared. Part B. Summary of the Facts The committee has received testimony and evidence that 1. Rebozo ordered and paid for expenses totaling over $50,000 for President Nixon during the periods following both the 1968 and 1972 presidential elections. 2. These payments were made by Rebozo despite the fact that all other expenses of President Nixon were paid for by check issued against his bank accounts or by debit memos drawn against his bank accounts. Rebozo has the authority to draw against the President's account at the Key Biscayne Bank by issuing debit memos for cashier's checks and bank transfers. Although he has regularly used this procedure, he did not do so for these transactions. 3. Substantial payments furnished by Rebozo on behalf of President Nixon were made in cash, 
and when Rebozo paid the same companies for work done for his own benefit, he paid by check. 4. Expenses paid for by Rebozo included $45,621.15 for improvements and furnishings at the President's 500 and 516 Bay Lane properties in Key Biscayne, Florida. The records reflecting expenditures for these improvements were withheld from the firm of Coopers and Librand and do not appear in their August 1973 examination of the President's assets and liabilities, which covered the period from January 1, 1969 to May 31, 1973. 5. Currency totaling at least $23,500 was deposited by Rebozo in trust accounts not in his name to pay for the president's expenses, thus concealing the true source of these payments. All currency so deposited was in $100 bills. 6. In addition to Rebozo's role as the president's personal agent regarding the Key Biscayne property, President Nixon was aware of and concurred in at least some of these improvements to his properties. 7. Substantial funds used to pay for expenses and gifts of President Nixon were transmitted to trust accounts in the name of Rebozo's attorney, a process which concealed the source of the funds. 8. The sum of $4,562, which originated as campaign contributions, was passed by Rebozo through three bank accounts and a cashier's check, none in his name, to purchase jewellery given by the President as a gift to his wife. 9. Throughout the period during which these expenditures were made on the President's behalf, Rebozo had access to substantial amounts of cash retained from campaign contributions received. 10. The Coopers and Librand examination of the President's assets and liabilities as of May 31, 1973, reflects no liabilities payable to Rebozo. 11. Rebozo did not file a U.S. gift tax return for calendar years 1969, 1970, 1971, or 1972, as required by the Internal Revenue Code, Section 6019, Part A. 12. The President reimbursed Rebozo in the amount of $13,642.52 for the portion of the cost of construction of a pool on the President's property. This reimbursement occurred after Rebozo returned funds to representatives of Hughes, and despite the fact that Coopers and Librand report reflected no liability payable to Rebozo. 13. During November 1972, Rebozo expended at least $20,000 in currency on the President's behalf. 14. According to Rebozo's testimony and financial records, the only parent sources available to Rebozo for a substantial portion of the $20,000 in currency used in November 1972 were campaign contributions. Part C. The Coopers and Librand Report On August 20th, 1973, the accounting firm of Coopers and Librand issued a report on the President's assets and liabilities. They reported in a letter to the President on improvements and furnishings to his properties at 500 and 516 Bay Lane that Through May 31st, 1973, you paid from your personal funds for improvements to these properties in the amounts of $37,942 with respect to 500 Bay Lane and $38,479 dollars with respect to 516 Bay Lane, as follows. 500 Bay Lane, improvements, $24,734, furnishings, $13,208, totaling $37,942, 516 Bay Lane, improvements, $29,687, furnishings, $8,792, totaling $38,479. Total improvements, $54,421. For furnishings, $22,000. Total, $76,421.
The details of these expenditures are as follows. Improvement costs paid by President Nixon on his Key Biscayne properties. Contractor. Abcock Company Builders, Incorporated, Paid April 14th, 1969. Service. Remove existing bedroom and construct executive office. Paid May 16th, 1969. 516 Bay Lane, $14,765. Alterations and repairs paid May 2nd, 1969 to May 13th, 1969. 500 Bay Lane, $3,224.19. Alterations and repairs paid April 24th, 1969 and May 2nd, 1969. 516 Bay Lane, seven hundred and ninety nine dollars and forty nine cents alterations executive office paid august eleventh nineteen sixty nine five hundred and sixteen bay lane eleven thousand three hundred and seven dollars and twelve cents alterations and repairs paid november twelfth nineteen sixty nine five hundred bay lane six thousand two hundred and ninety nine dollars and forty four cents contractor Caldwell Scott Construction Service Remodeling Paid July twenty ninth, nineteen sixty nine and august twenty sixth, nineteen sixty nine five hundred Bay Lane fifteen thousand two hundred and ten dollars and thirty eight cents Contractor Little Lair and Pilkington Paid april fourteenth, nineteen sixty nine and june seventeenth, nineteen sixty nine 516 Bay Lane, $2,132.60. Contractor, Metals Tech Incorporated. Service Panels. Paid October the 1st, 1969. 516 Bay Lane, $314.80. Contractor, Rablin Shelton. Service Furnishings. Paid July 31st, 1969, 500 Bay Lane, $10,000. Paid October 31st, 1970, 500 Bay Lane, $3,208.23. 516 Bay Lane, $8,791.77. Total, $12,000. Loan charges per record, 516 Bay Lane, three hundred and sixty eight dollars and fifty cents total five hundred bay lane thirty seven thousand nine hundred and forty two dollars and twenty four cents five hundred and sixteen bay lane thirty eight thousand four hundred and seventy nine dollars and twenty eight cents total seventy six thousand four hundred and twenty one dollars and fifty two cents the above expenditures totaling $76,421.52 were made from the President's personal funds, usually by debit memo, against his bank accounts at the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company, for cashier's checks or bank checks issued to the suppliers. Part D. Expenditures by Rebozo concealed from accountants. The Select Committee's investigation however, reflects actual expenditures for the same period on the President's properties as follows. 500 Bay Lane Improvements, $54,364 Furnishings, $14,939 Totaling, $69,303 516 Bay Lane Improvements, $42,441 Furnishings, $9,930, totaling in $52,371, total improvements, $96,805, for furnishings, $24,869, total $121,674. As noted in the above schedules, Costs for improvements and furnishings reported by Coopers and Lybrand amounted to $76,053, plus $368.50 in loan charges, whereas actual expenditures for improvements and furnishings amounted to at least $36,000.
$121,674. Expenditures for improvements and furnishings amounting to $45,621 were not included in the President's records when the records were presented to the accounting firm. These expenditures made for improvements on and furnishings of the President's properties at 500 Bay Lane and 516 Bay Lane from 1969 to 1972 include the following. Conversion of garage into living quarters, $11,978.84. Swimming pool and accessories, $18,435.18. Extension of roof. $6,508.11 Fireplace $3,586 Architectural model of 500 Bay Lane $395.65 Putting green $243.57 Billiard table $1,138.80 Architect fees and tile repairs $3,335 giving a total of $45,621.15 These improvements were directed and paid for by Charles G. Robozo with funds derived from the following sources 1. By personal checks of Charles G. Robozo account number 1-34 $13,361.50 2. By checks from trust accounts, $23,213.01. 3. By currency, $5,065.28. 4. By form unknown, believed to be currency, $3,981.65. Giving the total, $45,621.15. Funds deposited in the above-mentioned trust accounts included currency amounting to $23,500. Thomas Wakefield stated the currency deposited in the trust account consisted of $100 bills. Accordingly, the total currency which may have been used to finance these expenditures amounted to $32,259.94. Part E the improvements on the President's Key Biscayne properties. In December 1968, President Nixon, Mrs. Nixon, Mr. and Mrs. David Eisenhower, and Mr. Rebozo met with Mr. Jamie Borelli of architectural firm Buters Borelli and Albeza, in brackets, BBA, to discuss possible alterations to the 500 Bay Lane property. Plans were thereafter prepared and revisions made from time to time. On most occasions, Mr. Rebozo would take the plans to Washington, D.C. for review by the President and his family. Documents in the files of the committee reflect that Mr. Rebozo was consulted and made decisions on every aspect of modification and alterations to 500 Bay Lane. Section 1. Architect Fees and Tile Repairs $3,335 The architectural firm of Buters, Borelli and Albeza was formed in the latter part of 1968. Donald A. Butas is a nephew of Rebozo. Rebozo always paid this firm for improvements on the President's properties with currency. According to the architect's records furnished to the staff, the following currency payments were made by Mr. Rebozo. By date, February 10, 1969, $400. March 7, 1969, $400. March 19, 1969, $300. April 2, 1969, $581, totaling $1,681. Rebozo also paid $1,654 in cash for the work done by Designers Flooring Company. The payments were made as follows. By date, April the 11th, 1969, $754. May 26th, 1969, $300. July 22nd, 1969, $600. Totaling 
$654. Presidents' records through May 31, 1973 and Rebozo's records do not reflect any reimbursement to Rebozo by President Nixon. It is also of interest that when Rebozo made a $500 payment to Donald Buters on January 6, 1969, and $273 on March 6, 1969, to Designers Flooring Company, in connection with work on his own property at 490 Bay Lane, payment was made by personal check. Section 2. Architectural model of 500 Bay Lane, $395.65. Buters, Pirelli and Abeza, architects, received two payments from Mr. Rebozo amounting to $395.65 for a model of 500 Bay Lane in connection with remodeling work on President Nixon's properties. The payments were made by Mr. Rebozo as follows. January 18, 1969, $295.65, followed by March 14, 1969, $100, giving the total $395.65. Although the BBA representative contacted was unable to state whether payment was made in currency, no charge was found on Mr. Rebozo's bank statement, indicating that a check from Mr. Rebozo had been issued in payment. Section 3. Conversion of garage into living quarters. 516 Bay Lane, $11,978.84. Robert Little, former senior partner in the architectural firm of Little, Layer and Pilkington, stated that he met with President Richard Nixon and Charles G. Rebozo, in 1969 at the Key Biscayne compound to discuss remodeling of the President's property at 516 Bay Lane. This discussion initially entailed plans to be drawn by Mr. Little's firm in the construction of a bedroom and general remodeling. Later, Little was directed by Mr. Rebozo to revise these plans since Mrs. Nixon wanted the garage on 516 Bay Lane property converted into a living room, bedroom and bar. The fees paid to Little, Lair and Pilkington were made by cheque from the President's bank account and thus are included in the records furnished to the Coopers and Lightbrand accounting firm. The conversion itself was described in documents furnished the committee as 516 Bay Lane convert two-car garage into efficiency with living room, bedroom and bath. Starting date May 25th, 1969. The work was done by Babcock Company Builders, Incorporated, and payment of $11,978.84 was made on August 6th, 1969, by Mr. Rebozo's personal check number 4169, drawn on his account number 1-0034 in the Key Best Game Bank. Although Mr. Rebozo purported to make all 1,969 cancelled checks available to the committee staff, this check for $11,978.84 was not included. The financial records of Mr. Rebozo and the President show no reimbursement of this expenditure to Mr. Rebozo by President Nixon through May 31, 1973. Section 4. Putting Green at 516 Bay Lane, $243.57. The Bartlett Construction Company installed an armoured Palmer putting green at President Nixon's 516 Bay Lane property. The bill submitted, amounting to $243.57, was paid by Mr. Rebozo's personal cheque, account number 1-34, on June 17, 1969. Again, records reviewed by the staff do not reflect reimbursement by the President to Mr. Rebozo for this expenditure. Section 5. The President's Payments for Work on His Key Biscayne Properties, $76,053.02 While the preceding payments represent amounts paid by Mr. Rebozo in 1969 for work on the President's properties, he continued to oversee and ordered other work to be done at the President's homes. Payments were made for these other expenses from the personal account of the President in the Key Biscayne Bank. In most of these instances, 
an advice of charge, authorised by Mr. Rebozo, was made against the President's account for a cashier's check or Key Biscayne Bank check issued to the supplier or contractor. In two instances, a personal check was drawn on the President's account. These payments, all of which were charged to the President's account, number 2-527 in the Key Biscayne Bank, are shown above on page 1033. Mr. Rebozo was, therefore, in a position to charge the President's bank account for any expenditures affecting the President's properties. End of section 20. Section 21 of the Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3. Chapter 8, The Hughes-Rebozo Investigation and Related Matters, Part 14. F. The Wakefield Trust Accounts Within the ten months following the 1968 election, Rebozo paid expenses of the president totaling $17,091.86, with cash or with checks charged to Rebozo's account. Within the three months following the 1972 campaign, Rebozo paid for $28,529.29 of expenses incurred on the president's behalf from funds concealed in trust accounts under the control of Rebozo's attorney, Thomas H. Wakefield. In mid-November of 1972, Jack Brown, an employee of the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company, who is regularly used as an agent by Rebozo, ordered from J. H. Claggett, Inc., a general contractor, the extension of the existing roof at 500 Bay Lane to cover the patio. At that time, Brown, acting on the instructions of Mr. Rebozo, represented himself to be an agent of the President. On November 17, 1972, an application for a building permit was filed with the Metropolitan Dade County Building and Zoning Board in the name of Charles G. Rebozo for 500 Bay Lane. Mr. Rebozo's name was subsequently crossed out, and the name of Richard M. Nixon was written above it. On November 24, 1972, $10,000 in $100 bills were deposited to the Thomas H. Wakefield Trust Account number 05-791-19, at the First National Bank of Miami, on behalf of Rebozo. This trust account had remained inactive from October 31, 1968, to November 24, 1972, with a balance of $76.24. On November 30, 1972, J. H. Claggett, Inc., submitted an invoice for $6,508.11 to Jack Brown at the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company as a bill for Rebozo Compound. On December 7, 1972, Thomas H. Wakefield, representing C. G. Rebozo, drew a check to J. H. Claggett, Inc. for $6,508.11 against the Thomas H. Wakefield Trust Account in which $10,000 was deposited two weeks previously. There is no record of any reimbursement for this expense to Rebozo by President Nixon. Thomas H. Wakefield is a signator on the following accounts. Bank, First National Bank of Miami. Name of account, 1. Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust Account. Account number 11-611-1. Date opened May 18, 1970. 2. Wakefield and Underwood Trust Account, 6-681-1. 3. Thomas H. Wakefield Trust Account, 05-791-9. Date opened June 24, 1947. Bank, Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company. Name of account, 4. Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust Account. Account number 1-673. 5. Thomas H. Wakefield Special Account, 2-691. Date opened June 24, 1947. 
Date opened April 15, 1969. 6. Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Special Account. Account number 1-067. Testimony and documents received by the committee indicate that Mr. Rebozo, as a client of Wakefield, has had transactions related to at least five of these trust accounts. Thomas Wakefield refused to produce any records relating to transactions on behalf of Mr. Rebozo or of the President in his trust accounts on the grounds of attorney-client privilege. He also invoked this privilege in response to questions regarding these transactions during an executive session of the committee, although he did provide some information at interviews. Mr. Rebozo refused the committee's request that he waive the attorney-client privilege and allow Wakefield to explain these transactions. In order to obtain information regarding these transactions, it has been necessary to serve subpoenas directly on the banks involved. Although some records were provided for one account on a previous occasion, Rebozo, as president of the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company, failed to produce records for the remaining trust accounts when they were subpoenaed in October 1973 and again in June 1974. 1. Construction of swimming pool and accessories, $18,435.18. Rebozo signed a contract with the Catalina Pool Company of Miami, Florida, on November 14, 1972, for a 20 by 40 foot pool to be constructed at President Nixon's residence at 500 Bay Lane, Key Biscayne. A permit for the construction of this swimming pool was obtained by a representative of Catalina Pools, Inc from the Metropolitan Dade County Board on November 15, 1972. The permit reflects the pool to hold 31,000 gallons, and the cost is estimated to be $9,000. Construction on the pool began on November 17, and was completed on November 28, 1972. The documents received by the committee indicate that the bills for this work were to be sent to Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster, attorneys, Miami, Florida. The expenditures relating to this pool amounted in the aggregate to $18,435.18 as follows. Paid to Catalina Inc. for construction, $10,100. Belcher Oil Company for pool heater, $1,727.26. Climatrol Inc. for screening around swimming pool. $3,600. Paul's Carpets, Pool Carpet, $1,277.64. Brown Jordan, for pool furniture delivered to 478 Bay Lane, $1,730.28. Total, $18,435.18. The pool bills were paid from the following sources. Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust Account, First National Bank of Miami, number 11-611-1, $14,977.64, Key Biscayne Bank, number 1-673, $1,727.26, Cash from Rebozo, $1,730.28, Total, $18,435.18. The payments to Catalina Pools, Inc. were made from the Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust account in the First National Bank of Miami as follows. Date, November 20, 1972. Amount, $1,000. November 22, 1972, $5,935. November 23, 1972, $2,000. December 18, 1972, $1,165. Total, $10,100. Each check has a notation reflecting that the transaction is on behalf of C.G. Rebozo. Wakefield also indicated that Mr. Rebozo was his client in the case of each check. Ann Harvey, Herbert Kalmbach's secretary, stated that in the summer or fall of 1972, she received an inquiry from Mr. Rebozo asking for specification of the pool that had been constructed at the President's San Clemente estate. 2. Pool Heater Documents obtained pursuant to a subpoena ducis tecum 
on the Belcher Oil Company indicate that Mr. Rebozo ordered a heater for the President's pool at 500 Bay Lane on or about November 15, 1972. The heater was paid for on February 20, 1973, by a check in the amount of $1,727.26, drawn on funds in the Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust account number 1-673, located at the Key Biscayne Bank. The check has a notation on it, invoice dated January 31, 1973, Rebozo, C.G., the committee has not been furnished with the details of this trust account number 1-673 since Mr. Rebozo, who was served with a subpoena in his capacity as president of the Key Biscayne Bank, has refused to comply with the subpoena duques tecum. The committee, however, received evidence that substantial amounts on behalf of Mr. Rebozo have been deposited in this account, including at least $3,500 in $100 bills. Wakefield indicated the Key Biscayne Trust involved significantly greater sums related to Mr. Rebozo than his trust account at the First National Bank. Wakefield estimated deposits through his Key Biscayne Bank trust account on behalf of Mr. Rebozo of approximately $200,000. 3. Screen Enclosure at Pool The evidence in possession of the committee reflects that on or about November 16, 1972, Mr. Charles G. Rebozo ordered from Climatrol Corp. a screen enclosure installed at 500 Bay Lane, Key Biscayne, Florida. Mr. Rebozo requested plans for the screens to be provided for the President's review at Camp David, Maryland. Payments to Climatrol Corp. were made as follows. Date, December 22, 1972. First National Bank of Miami. Account number 11-611-1, $1,500. December 22, 1972, First National Bank of Miami. Account number 05-791-9, $1,100. December 28, 1972, First National Bank of Miami. Account number 05-791-9, $1,000. It will be noted that the first check was drawn on the Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust account, while the remaining checks were drawn on the Thomas H. Wakefield Trust account. Thus, Climatrol was paid $3,600 in three checks signed by Thomas H. Wakefield on two different trust accounts that he used to pay for work ordered by Rebozo. With respect to the payment of $1,500 on December 22, 1972, it is noted that Mr. Rebozo's funds in trust account 11-611-1 were overdrawn on December 18, 1972, in the amount of $100. On December 22, 1972, currency amounting to $1,600 was deposited which cured the overdraft and provided the funds for the $1,500 check to Climatrol. The deposit of cash funds in the law firm trust accounts and subsequent issue of checks from said trust accounts concealed the fact that cash payments furnished by Mr. Rebozo were provided to pay for work on behalf of President Nixon. As indicated before, this method of payment was totally unnecessary since checks could have been written on the President's Key Biscayne accounts or debit memos drawn against these same accounts by the President's lawyers who had been assigned that role. 4. Pool Carpet The payment of $1,277.64 was made to Paul's Carpet, Inc. by check dated December 8, 1972, signed by Thomas H. Wakefield and drawn on his trust account in the First National Bank of Miami. This check was for work ordered by Mr. Rebozo on November 21, 1972 which was to provide for the installation of 182 yards of green grass, 100% polypropylene, for cementing at the pool at the President's home at 500 Bay Lane. Mr. Rebozo was billed at the Key Biscayne Bank for this expense. 5. Pool Furniture Documents received by the committee indicate that Mr. Rebozo, on January 26, 1973, ordered furniture for the pool area, to be delivered to Mr. Robert H. Abplanalp, 478 Bay Lane, Key Biscayne, Florida. Interviews and testimony before the committee, however, indicate that while Mr. Abplanalp is the owner of the property at 478 Bay Lane, 
he immediately leased it after purchase to the u.s government and this property does not have a pool in addition mr fabregas an interior designer for the bba architectural firm and mr steve morrison assistant sales manager for the brown jordan company who supplied the furniture at a cost of one thousand seven hundred and thirty dollars and twenty eight cents stated to the committee that mrs nixon insisted that the fabric of the furniture match exactly with the fabric of the presidential pool furniture which had been purchased for the san clemente property the committee has ascertained that rebozo paid the bba architectural firm for expenditures made to brown jordan and company by making deposits directly to their account at the key biscayne bank the first deposit was made in the bba account on february first nineteen seventy three in the amount of one thousand five hundred and nineteen dollars and fifty cents the second payment was disclosed to the bba firm in a letter dated february twentieth nineteen seventy three from mr rebozo's bookkeeper who enclosed a deposit ticket from mr rebozo to the firm's account for two hundred and ten dollars and seventy eight cents the deposit tickets and letter reflect the initials c g r and two hundred and ten dollars and seventy eight cents was deposited in cash the bba firm did not have in their files the deposit ticket for the one thousand five hundred and nineteen dollars and fifty cents and in an effort to determine if that deposit was also made in cash a subpoena ducas tecum was served on mr rebozo but he has refused to comply with the subpoena g summary of wakefield trust account payments a composite summary of the transactions relating to the construction of the pool and extension of the roof at 500 Bay Lane, as noted in the two trust account records received from the First National Bank of Miami, disclose the following. Total currency deposited. Amount $23,500. Payments to Catalina Pools, Inc., $10,100. J.B. Claggett, Inc., $6,508.11. Paul's Carpet, Inc., $1,277.64. Climatrol, $3,600. Belcher Oil Company, $356.25. Total, $21,842. Funds transferred to Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust Account Number 1-673 in Key Biscayne Bank, $2,255.52. Total disbursements, $24,097.52. Excess disbursed from firm trust account 11-611, $597.52. Funds in firm trust account number 05-791-9 from October 31, 1968 to October 31, 1972, $76.24 balance of excess disbursements five hundred and twenty one dollars and twenty three cents it is noted that the trust account number zero five dash seven nine one dash one nine in the name of thomas h wakefield contains only transactions relating to rebozo's activities however the trust account number one one dash six one one dash one in the firm's name is utilized by the law firm for more clients than just rebozo the currency amounting to $23,500 was deposited on Rebozo's behalf to trust accounts as follows. Date, November 16, 1972. Amount, $10,000. Account number, 11-611-1. November 24, 1972. $10,000. 5 791 9 December 22, 1972. $1,600. Account number 11-611-1. January 25, 1973. $200. Account number 11-611-1. April 4, 1973. $1,700. Account number 05-791-9. Total $23,500. Other currency deposited in the trust accounts, as revealed from the records furnished by the First National Bank of Miami, and from interview of Thomas H. Wakefield, are as follows. Account. In First National Bank of Miami, Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster, trust account 11-611-1. 
July 27, 1972, $3,500. July 2, 1973, $2,150. For a total of $5,650 in that account. In Key Biscayne Bank, Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster, trust account 1-673, date unknown, $3,500. Total, $9,150. Accordingly, at least $32,650 in currency has been deposited in three trust accounts on behalf of Rebozo. According to Thomas H. Wakefield, the currency deposited, as indicated above, consisted of $100 bills. Wakefield invoked attorney-client privilege as to the source of the funds and indicated that his client was Rebozo. However, Wakefield has stated that he never deposited currency on behalf of any client other than Rebozo. The currency received by Mr. Rebozo from Richard Danner, representative of Howard Hughes, and at least half of that from A.D. Davis, consisted of $100 bills. Furthermore, Rebozo reported in his September 1972 financial statements a total of $12,234.72 cash on hand and in unrestricted bank accounts, of which $2,453.78 is the balance in Rebozo's six bank accounts. According, therefore, to Rebozo's own figures, currency on hand would be approximately $9,780.94. Mr. Rebozo's only known source of currency during this period was his bank salary for the months of September, October, and two weeks in November 1972. The cash he received from this source amounted to $3,844.80, and assuming he spent no part of it, the full amount is being included in this computation as being available to Rebozo. Rebozo did not, during this period, or at any time since January 1, 1969, draw a check to cash for his own use, nor is there any indication that he received currency from business transactions. Therefore, Rebozo had a maximum of $13,665.74 in currency on hand at the November 15, 1972 salary date, which was just prior to the deposit of $20,000 in currency in the Wakefield Trust accounts. According to Rebozo's testimony and financial records made available to the committee, Rebozo did not have sufficient funds available on November 16 and November 24, 1972, at which time he made two $10,000 cash deposits. These funds, amounting to $20,000, were subsequently used for the President's behalf. A summary of information available to the Committee pertaining to the above analysis follows. Cash on hand and in unrestricted bank accounts, per financial statement of C. G. Rebozo at September 1, 1972, $12,234.72. Balance in Rebozo bank accounts at September 1, 1972. Account 1-34 in Key Biscayne Bank, $1,241.61. Account 1-262 in Key Biscayne Bank, $70.97. Account, account number 4-4179 in Key Biscayne Bank, $472.56. Account number 1-0886 in Key Biscayne Bank. $7.08. Account 4 in Greater Miami Federal Savings and Loan, $461.56. Account number 5-28170 in Manufacturer's Hanover, $200. Total cash in banks, $2,453.78. Currency on hand, August 31, 1972. $9,780.94. Currency from salary payments, September 15, 1972, $776.96. September 30, 1972, $776.96. October 15, 1972, $776.96. October 31, 1972, seven hundred and seventy six dollars and ninety six cents november fifteenth nineteen seventy two seven hundred and seventy six dollars and ninety six cents 
total currency assuming none spent three thousand eight hundred and eighty four dollars and eighty cents cash available at november fifteenth nineteen seventy two thirteen thousand six hundred and sixty five dollars and seventy four cents deposit in wakefield hewitt and webster trust account first national bank of miami account number one one dash six one one dash one november sixteenth nineteen seventy two in currency ten thousand dollars deposit in thomas h wakefield trust account first national bank of miami in currency account number zero five dash seven nine one dash nine november twenty fourth nineteen seventy two ten thousand dollars total currency payments twenty thousand dollars currency used in excess of currency from known sources six thousand three hundred and thirty four dollars and twenty six cents an additional analysis using earlier records also shows a shortage of currency mr rebozo reported in his september nineteen seventy one financial statement a total of forty seven thousand five hundred and twenty dollars and forty nine cents cash on hand and in unrestricted bank accounts his bank balance was in excess of this amount and therefore no currency was reported by rebozo as being on hand as of september first nineteen seventy one Rebozo's only known source of currency from September 1, 1971 through November 30, 1972, was his bank salary. During this period, Rebozo received $23,246.52 in currency for his bank account, but never issued any checks or debits from which currency was derived for his use. Assuming that Rebozo spent no part of his salary other than what he deposited, he had only $12,446.52 in currency from known sources, other than campaign funds, available to him during a period when he deposited $23,500 in the Wakefield Trust accounts on the President's behalf. Therefore, Rebozo must have had available to him at least $11,053.48 from some previously undisclosed source at a time when he had access to currency derived from campaign contributions. The information is summarized below. Cash on hand and in bank at September 1, 1971, per financial statement, $47,520.49. All of above is accounted for in banks. None. Currency received as salary from Key Biscayne Bank from September 1, 1971 to November 30, 1972, $23,246.52. Currency deposited during above period, $10,800. Currency available from known sources, $12,446.52. Currency payments for President Nixon's properties in Key Biscayne, $23,500. Currency used in excess of available currency from known sources, $11,053.48. These two analyses indicate that Rebozo had some previously undisclosed source of currency from which he drew funds on the President's behalf. According to his testimony and records, the only such source of currency available to him were campaign contributions. H. Rebozo's Financial Situation According to documents available to the committee, a substantial percentage of Rebozo's reported gross income went for the payment of interest on loans. A study of Mr. Rebozo's financial statements covering the period from September 1, 1968 to September 1, 1973 reflects a constant borrowing of funds from various banks and individuals in Dade County and also outside of Florida. His principal assets include stock in the Key Biscayne Bank and Fishers Island, Inc. Rebozo's total interest payments on loans during the five-year period amounted to almost $500,000, while his reported gross income during this period averaged to only $24,000 a year above his itemized deductions. Therefore, a considerable portion of his reported gross earnings, averaging approximately 72%, went to the payments of interest on Rebozo's loans. 1. No record of pool costs in President's books. Although at least $18,435.19 was expended in connection with the swimming pool on the President's property at 500 Bay Lane, 
no record whatsoever appeared in the 1972 or the 1973 accounting books of the President, maintained by Arthur Bletch, the President's certified public accountant. However, when Bletch was reviewing the accounts in early 1974, in connection with the preparation of the President's 1973 income tax return, he found a check signed by Rosemary Woods, the first she had ever signed on the President's account. The check was dated August 18, 1973, and was of further interest because it was payable to Mr. Rebozo in the amount of $13,642.52. Bletch noted also that the check was typewritten and that two different typewriters had been used from the typing on the check. As he had no idea what this check could have been for, he posted the item to account number 999, Suspense. Thereafter, he inquired of Ann Harvey and Frank DeMarco, and learned the payment was for the construction of a swimming pool, which had occurred in December 1972, and the check to Rebozo for $13,642.52, dated August 18, 1973, was a reimbursement for payments he had made. It is of interest to note that at the time of issue of this check in August 1973, Rebozo had returned $100,000 to Hughes, was under active investigation by the Internal Revenue Service, and the Senate Select Committee was indicating interest in the Hughes contribution. 2. The Fireplace Other documents received by the committee indicate that Rebozo ordered the construction of a fireplace for the President's home at 516 Bay Lane and instructed the contractor, J. H. Claggett, Inc., that the billing should be sent to Thomas H. Wakefield. The records received from Claggett indicate that the bill of $3,586 was paid on March 26, 1973, but Claggett has been unable to provide the form of the payment. That is, whether it was cash deposited in his Key Biscayne bank account or whether it may have been a Wakefield Trust account check. This item was not paid from the President's bank accounts, nor was it paid from Rebozo's bank accounts furnished to the committee. The committee attempted to determine how payment was made by service of a subpoena on Mr. Charles G. Rebozo as president of the Key Biscayne Bank, but he has failed to comply with the subpoena. 3. The Pool Table The committee has also received documents and information that Mr. Rebozo paid $1,138.30 by personal check on March 19, 1970, to William Brandt's Billiard Supply Company for a pool table ordered by Mr. Rebozo at 490 Bay Lane. This pool table has a gold covering. However, Mr. James Perdue, who assisted in the work being done on the President's properties, stated there is a pool table in President Nixon's home at 516 Bay Lane, and his description of this cover was identical to the one ordered by Rebozo as described above. 4. Fuel Oil Payments In addition to the payments to Belcher Oil Company for the pool heater, three payments were made to them from the two trust accounts in the First National Bank of Miami as follows. Date, January 25, 1973. Amount, $138.50. April 24, 1973. $75.88. May 16, 1973. $141.87. These checks are in payment of fuel oil delivered to the President's home at 500 Bay Lane and believed to have been used in the pool heater mentioned above. More recent invoices, including the invoice of June 29, 1973, indicate billings to Key Biscayne Bank for work performed at the President's home on 500 Bay Lane. For example, a cashier's check signed by Vernon L. Tucker an officer of the Key Biscayne Bank, in the amount of $38.16, was paid to the Belcher Oil Company. The space provided for the remitter was not filled in and thereby does not disclose who furnished the funds for the purchase of the cashier's check. End of Section 21. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 22 of The Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3, Chapter 8, The Hughes-Rebozo Investigation and Related Matters, Part 15. I. 
The Florida Nixon for President Committee Account Mr. Rebozo maintained an account in the Key Biscayne Bank in the name of the Florida Nixon for President Committee Account Number 1-0455. Although efforts have been made to obtain a copy of this account, and Rebozo promised to furnish a copy of the account to the committee, he has failed to do so. Mr. Rebozo was a signator to this account, and at least $426.87 was used from this campaign fund for the personal benefit of President Nixon. On February 19, 1969, Rebozo issued his own check in this amount of $426.87 to reimburse the campaign account. The check stub for check number 3867 reads, Reimbursement of Various Bills Advanced for RMN Personal. On April 14, 1969, Rebozo issued check number 1150 against funds in the Florida Nixon for President Committee account, payable to Herbert W. Kalmbach for the amount of $216.18. Part of these funds were subsequently used to pay expenses of Jack Caulfield, who conducted special investigatory work for John Ehrlichman. The following day, Mr. Rebozo issued a check for $6,000, payable to Thomas H. Wakefield, special account, drawn on the Florida Nixon for President Committee, and thereupon opened a new account, the Thomas H. Wakefield special account number 2-1691 in the Key Biscayne Bank. The signatures were Thomas H. Wakefield and Charles G. Rebozo, with either one authorized to sign. No address was shown for the mailing of statements the only notation being hold statements. Rebozo has testified that the $6,000 represented funds that were owed to him for one thing or another. He further testified that he was worried about how it might look if he wrote a check to himself. He testified that he created this special account in his attorney's name and wrote a check to it in order to receive the funds without drawing them to attention. Rebozo continued to sign all checks or authorized charges until the final closing of this account. The funds in this account were disbursed by Rebozo in the same manner as he handled the funds in the Florida Nixon for President Committee account, except that now the nature of the funds, that is, campaign funds, was concealed through the use of said special account. Disbursements from this account were as follows. Date, May 6, 1969, paid to Herbert W. Kalmbach, amount $200. Remarks subsequently paid to Jack Caulfield. May 23, 1969. Bank charge for checks, $4.66. May 29, 1969. Pitney Bowes, Inc., $124.80. Invoice number 65-182408. July 25, 1969. Herbert W. Kalmbach, $1,000 subsequently paid to Tony Ulasiewicz. September 10, 1969, Thunderbird Studio, $108.16, balance due, pictures at reception of President Nixon. June 28, 1972, Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust Account Number 1-673, $4,562.38, use discussed below. Total, $6,000. Rebozo has refused a committee request that he provide documents showing the purpose of the original transfer of $6,000 of campaign funds to the Thomas H. Wakefield special account. It will be noted that this special account, derived from 1968 campaign funds, maintained a balance of $4,562.38 for almost three years. On June 28, 1972, Rebozo closed it out by transferring the funds through an advice of charge to the Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust Account number 1-673 in the Key Biscayne Bank. The same day, a check was issued for $5,000 against account 1-673, and the proceeds of this check were deposited in the Wakefield, Hewitt, and Webster Trust Account number 11-611-1 in the First National Bank of Miami. Also on the same day, a check was issued from this account purchasing a cashier's check from the First National Bank of Miami payable to Harry Winston in the amount of $5,000. These funds were used to purchase platinum diamond earrings, 
a birthday gift to Mrs. Nixon from President Nixon, as indicated here and after. J. Purchase of earrings for Mrs. Nixon from Harry Winston. The records of Harry Winston, a jeweler in New York City, reflect that on March 17, 1972, a set of platinum diamond earrings containing tops, 16 pear-shaped diamonds, bottoms, two pear-shaped diamonds, two tapered baguette diamonds, were delivered to Lieutenant Commander Alex Larzelier, who was then attached to the White House staff. The consignment slip of March 17, 1972, indicates in handwriting, Rosemary, in the upper left-hand corner. Lieutenant Commander Larzelier delivered the earrings to his superior at the White House, and was told that they were for President Nixon's gift to his wife on her birthday. On the copies of the bills addressed to President Richard Nixon, as indicated in handwriting of the salesman, please send to Rosemary Woods. The full cost of these earrings is shown as $5,650, with payment being made as follows according to Harry Winston's records. Paid to President Richard M. Nixon, amount $5,000, deposited at First National Bank of Miami. President Richard M. Nixon, $560, Riggs National Bank. Rosemary Woods, $90, First National Bank of Washington. Total, $5,650. The $5,000 check, as previously stated, was a cashier's check drawn on the First National Bank of Miami and derived from the Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust Account Number 11-611-1 in the First National Bank. The funds in this account were transferred from the Wakefield Firm Trust Account Number 1-673 in the Key Biscayne Bank, and $4,562.38 was received by the firm's trust account from the Thomas Wakefield Special Account Number 2-1691 in the Key Biscayne Bank. The funds in the special account were derived from the Florida Nixon for President Committee. Therefore, $4,562.38 of funds originally derived from campaign contributions were used to purchase platinum diamond earrings. This complex four-stage process of payment for this gift concealed the fact that the funds originated from contributions to the 1968 campaign and were ultimately used by Rebozo on behalf of President Nixon. K. President Nixon Beneficiary of Loan Notes Signed by C.G. Rebozo the examination of the President's assets and liabilities dated August 20, 1973, by the accounting firm of Coopers & Librand noted that the President had purchased property at 500 Bay Lane, Key Biscayne, Florida, consisting of land, building, and furnishings, on December 19, 1968, from Senator George A. Smathers for $125,000. Their report also noted the President had purchased land at 516 Bay Lane for $127,928, and the down payments for these properties came from the proceeds of a loan obtained in the amount of $65,000 on December 19, 1968, from the First National Bank of Miami. When President Nixon acquired the Key Biscayne properties, he assumed the existing mortgages and a note for $65,000 which was executed by C.G. Rebozo with the First National Bank of Miami. This note was dated December 19, 1968, payable 32 days later at 7% interest. The proceeds of this note were used to pay the owners of the property as follows. Paid to Senator and Mrs. George A. Smathers, amount $43,497. Manuel Arca, Jr. and Evora Bonnet de Arca, $20,243. Closing expenditures, $643. Total, $64,383. Cash remitted to President Nixon, $617. Total, $65,000. Wakefield stated that Rebozo paid him legal fees incurred for the purchase of 500 and 516 Bay Lane, and he considered Rebozo to be his client for said purchase. This transaction handled by Rebozo not only provided the President with the Key Biscayne properties without the investment of any funds on his part, in fact, the President received $617, but the obligation on the $65,000 note was accepted by C.G. Rebozo. In this connection, 
the liability ledger includes this sixty five thousand dollar loan in the name of richard m and patricia r nixon while the demand tickler sheet was in the name of c g rebozo although this loan was due january twentieth nineteen sixty nine it was changed on that date to a demand loan and was not paid until September 4, 1969. On that date, Mr. Richard Stearns, Senior Vice President of the Key Biscayne Bank, forwarded a cashier's check charged to the President's account in the Key Biscayne Bank, with letter reading as follows. Enclosed you will find our cashier's check number 10864 in the amount of $65,763.75 of which $65,000 is payment on the principal note of Mr. C. G. Rebozo, and $763.75 for interest. In the report of the Joint Committee on Internal Revenue Taxation, on their examination of President Nixon's tax returns, evidence was adduced that on March 12, 1973, the sum of $65,000 was transferred from the President's account to Mr. Rebozo as a three-year loan payable to Mrs. Patricia Cox at 8% interest. This amount was part of the proceeds of the sale of property on December 28, 1972, which property had been acquired by the President from Cape Florida Development, Inc. L. Summary of Total Payments on Behalf of President Nixon A summary of the payments made by Rebozo on behalf of the President, as disclosed from documents and interviews discussed herein, reflects a pattern of Rebozo expenditures of at least $50,000. The committee has obviously not been able to identify conclusively all the payments made by Rebozo as the pertinent records desired from Rebozo and his Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company have never been produced, and Rebozo has refused to comply with subpoenas ducis tecum served on him. Any further investigation by other investigatory bodies should focus initially on obtaining the trust account records from the Key Biscayne Bank that this committee has been unable to obtain. While the committee has been unable to determine, based on documents received to date, if the transfer of $65,000 to Mr. Rebozo on March 12, 1973, was related in any way to the note Mr. Rebozo signed on behalf of President Nixon for $65,000, the committee's letter to Mr. St. Clair of June 6, 1974, asked for any information or documents from the President which might clarify any relationship between the two transactions. The letter inquired, The committee would appreciate learning under what circumstances Mr. Rebozo incurred the above-described obligation, referring to the signing of the note, and what, if any, consideration he received for incurring said obligation. As noted below, the committee received a response to its letter from Counsel St. Clair, which failed to respond to any of the specific issues raised by the committee's inquiry. M. $20,000 cash funds in Rebozo's possession, September 1969. Since 1964, Rebozo has followed the practice of preparing and mailing to banks from which he has received loans a financial statement as of September 1st of each year, showing his assets, liabilities, net worth, and other financial data. Of interest in connection with his September 1, 1969 financial statement is the fact that he included therein cash on hand of $20,000. As the evidence tended to show, this is the month during which Richard Danner delivered a $50,000 campaign contribution from Howard Hughes to B.B. Rebozo. Specifically, the financial statement executed on October 9, 1969, and mailed to the manufacturer's Hanover Trust Company, showing his assets, liabilities, and net worth as of September 1, 1969, includes as cash on hand and unrestricted in banks, $23,741.36. Mr. Rebozo's checking account number 1-34 in the Key Biscayne Bank shows a balance as of September 1, 1969, of $3,741.36. The difference between the amount in the bank, $3,741.36, and the amount shown on his financial statement, $23,741.36, is $20,000, which sum would have to be currency. It is of interest to note that the following year, September 1, 1970, Rebozo's financial statement shows cash on hand and unrestricted in banks, $44,691.20.
this amount agrees to the penny with the balance in rebozo's bank account number one three four at the key biscayne bank when questioned at executive session on march twenty first nineteen seventy four Rebozo denied the $20,000 represented cash. He stated that funds in a savings account in a bank in Key West were included in his cash. However, the documentation he forwarded to the committee does not support his statement. Since the amount in the savings account of the first federal savings and loan of Key West, Florida, is in the name of Monroe Land and Title Company, and the balance is less than $2,000. When questioned on March 21, 1974, Rebozo also denied that the $20,000 was cash that Richard Danner had brought to him as part of the Hughes contribution. In addition, Rebozo was asked if he ever had a sum of $50,000 in cash since January 1, 1969, to which Rebozo answered, No, I never had that much cash, not deposited. Mr. Rebozo was also questioned as to whether he had ever loaned any money to the president since January 1, 1969, and answered, I haven't, but the bank has. Wait a minute, not since January of 1969, though. Rebozo was also asked, And have you ever given any gifts of cash or stock or any other negotiable commodity of value in excess of $1,000 to the president? Mr. Rebozo answered, No. Rebozo was also asked, have you ever cashed any checks in excess of $10,000 in the president's behalf for cash? And again, Rebozo answered no. In addition to the expenditures already commented upon, Rebozo's personal bank records furnished to the committee reveal he issued personal checks for a variety of expenses incurred on President Nixon's Key Biscayne properties between January 24, 1969 and May 12, 1970 which checks total $832.32. Of this sum, Rebozo's records reflect he received one reimbursement from the President in the amount of $127.77 on February 14, 1969. The records maintained by the President's accountant reviewed by the committee also reflects that the President had made only one reimbursement of $127.77 through May 31, 1973. N. The President's Response In a letter of June 6, 1974, Chairman Irvin and Vice Chairman Baker furnished most of the above-described information to Mr. James St. Clair, counsel to the President. The letter noted as its purpose that the Committee has received certain evidence that may relate to information and documents in possession of the President or his representatives. We wish to afford the President an opportunity to comment on this material prior to the filing of this report. We would appreciate any assistance you can provide in clarifying the issues set forth below and in aiding us in reviewing this evidence. Information provided will be especially helpful in those areas where the committee has not had access to all available documents and where systematic analysis has been impossible since only random documentation has been provided us. On June 24, 1974, the committee received a response to its letter from Mr. St. Clair in behalf of the President. After characterizing the committee's letter and indicating he had reviewed it with the President on June 20, 1974, Mr. St. Clair makes two general responses. The President has made public an audit of his affairs dated August 20, 1973, certified by Coopers and Librand, which, he is confident, reflected fully his receipts and expenditures for the period covered. I believe that the only useful comment that can be made in response to your letter is to convey the President's assurance that he never instructed C.G. Rebozo to raise and maintain funds to be dispersed for the President's personal behalf, nor, so far as he knows, was this ever done. As a result, the President, through his counsel, has failed to respond to any of the specific inquiries delineated in the Committee's letter and therefore has not provided information that might assist the Committee in its review of these matters. O. Oh, Rebozo's Response When Mr. Rebozo was questioned at an executive session, the committee did not have in its possession information which disclosed Rebozo's substantial expenditures on behalf of President Nixon. He was asked if, on occasion, he had paid miscellaneous bills for 500 Bay Lane. Rebozo replied in the affirmative, and when he was asked if he had been reimbursed for these expenditures, he answered, Yes, I say, usually I'm not going to nitpick with the President. If there's something I think he should have, 
I might just go ahead and do it without even him knowing about it. He just doesn't concern himself at all with financial problems ever. He never has. The committee has subpoenaed from Rebozo and from the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company records of expenditures during the relevant periods paid for or on behalf of President Richard Nixon, Rosemary Woods, F. Donald Nixon, Donald A. Nixon, and Edward Nixon. Rebozo had, both individually and in his capacity as president of the Key Biscayne Bank and Trust Company, refused to produce these records. After the facts discussed above were developed by the committee, a subpoena was issued for Rebozo's appearance and served on his attorney, thus providing Rebozo with an opportunity to respond. His attorney informed the committee that Rebozo had left the country and that he was no longer authorized to accept service on Rebozo's behalf. P. Other Recipients of Campaign Funds As noted above, the committee received evidence that Rebozo advised Kalmbach that he had furnished part of the funds received from Hughes to the President's brothers. Both F. Donald and Edward Nixon have denied under oath to the select committee having received any funds or gifts from Mr. Charles G. Rebozo. The committee, however, has been unable to make a conclusive determination as to whether Messrs. Edward or F. Donald Nixon received any of the proceeds of the Hughes contribution to Rebozo. Due to the failure and refusal of both to comply with the subpoena duces tecum, which sought certain documents and records deemed by the committee pertinent to its inquiry, and to testify after being advised questions would relate to whether either received the proceeds of campaign contributions. The chart on the following page traces currency and bank funds controlled by C.G. Rebozo and expended for the benefit of President Nixon and others. The figures reflected in the chart do not reflect necessarily all such possible transactions due to Mr. Rebozo's failure to comply fully with subpoenas served on him for records relating to those transactions. The chart does reflect, however, the flow of cash currency in and out of three trust accounts and a special account, all in the name of Mr. Rebozo's attorney, Thomas H. Wakefield. The chart also reflects amounts expended for alterations, additions, and improvements on the President's Key Biscayne properties and for other items purchased in his behalf. The chart, for example, shows that $6,000 of campaign contributions were deposited in the Florida Nixon for President Committee, which funds were later transferred to the Thomas H. Wakefield Special Account at the Key Biscayne Bank. The chart then shows the flow of $4,562.38 from the Wakefield Special Account to the Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust Account, and on the same date $5,000 was withdrawn from said trust account and deposited in the Wakefield Hewitt and Webster Trust Account at the First National Bank of Miami. On the same date as that transfer, a cashier's check was purchased at the First National Bank of Miami, which was furnished to Harry Winston, a jeweler in New York, for the purchase of platinum and diamond earrings furnished by President Nixon to his wife on her birthday in March of 1972. End of section 22. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of the Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3. Chapter 8. The Hughes-Rebozo Investigation and Related Matters, Part 16. 11. A Summary Analysis of Conflicting Evidence. In the course of its investigation into the receipt, by Rebozo, of $100,000 from Hughes, the Senate Select Committee has received considerable evidence a significant portion of which reflects conflicts in principal witnesses' testimony. To allow for an appropriate review of rather complex factual materials, a summary analysis of said conflicting testimony on important issues is presented here. A. Initiator of the Contribution When asked on March 20, 1973, who brought up the Hughes contribution first, Mr. Rebozo replied, Danner brought it up with me. I had no reason to bring it up with Danner. He was a practicing lawyer in Washington and was not even connected with Hughes. 
in his testimony on december eighteenth nineteen seventy three mr richard danner was asked if it was danner who initiated the discussions about the possibility of getting a contribution from the hughes tool company or mr hughes danner replied no i had no contact with the hughes tool company none whatsoever in that respect i didn't know any of the principals involved and when the question arose as to whether i could do anything in that light i agreed to talk to ed morgan mr rebozo also testified on march twentieth nineteen seventy four that he never met with candidate nixon and richard danner to discuss the possibility of obtaining a contribution from howard hughes in the nineteen sixty eight campaign however mr richard danner testified on december eighteenth nineteen seventy three that mr nixon was present at the first discussion of a possible hughes contribution and that either candidate nixon or mr rebozo first asked danner to ascertain if hughes would make a contribution after rebozo denied that candidate nixon was present in the first discussion about the hughes contribution in nineteen sixty eight danner was asked again about candidate nixon's presence in an executive session on july twelfth nineteen seventy four danner again confirmed that president nixon and rebozo had both been present in the first meeting when the hughes contribution was brought up b actual delivery of funds on march twentieth nineteen seventy four mr rebozo testified that he received the first fifty thousand dollar cash contribution from richard danner on july third nineteen seventy at the staff mess at san clemente and that he received the second fifty thousand dollar cash contribution from richard danner in august nineteen seventy at his office in the key biscayne bank in key biscayne florida however when rebozo first met with i r s agents on may tenth nineteen seventy three he testified that he received the first delivery in late nineteen sixty eight or early nineteen sixty nine and that he received the second delivery two or three months later at that time rebozo could not recall whether he had received the first package in key biscayne or san clemente but that he had received one package in each location mr rebozo also told the i r s agents on may tenth nineteen seventy three that robert mayhew may have been present in florida when rebozo received the contribution in florida but was not present at the time of the delivery on july tenth nineteen seventy three when rebozo met again with i r s agents he recalled that the first contribution had been in nineteen sixty nine at the san clemente inn since to the best of his knowledge danner had never been inside the san clemente compound it was not until his october eighth nineteen seventy three interview with the senate select committee that rebozo finally fixed on july third nineteen seventy as being the date of the first contribution and the san clemente western white house as being the place for that delivery however on june eighteenth nineteen seventy three rebozo told kenneth whittaker special agent in charge of the miami fbi office that he had received fifty thousand dollars in cash from richard danner in nineteen sixty nine in addition richard danner testified before the senate select committee on december eighteenth nineteen seventy three that he could not recall whether the first delivery of cash was in the late summer of nineteen sixty nine in key biscayne florida or on july third nineteen seventy at sam clemente similarly robert mayhew also places the first delivery of fifty thousand dollars in nineteen sixty nine mayhew testified in a deposition on july fourth nineteen seventy three that mr danner made the first delivery which would have been some time in nineteen sixty nine similarly robert mayhew was certain that he was present at the delivery of the cash in key biscayne he recalls seeing the envelope containing the cash passed from danner to rebozo and recalls that danner rebozo and mayhew left rebozo's home in rebozo's car to dine at solomon dell's restaurant after danner had given rebozo the cash richard danner completely supported mayhew's version of the first delivery in danner's first interview with the i r s on may fifteenth nineteen seventy two danner subsequently changed his i r s testimony on july fifth nineteen seventy three after he had had discussions about the matter with rebozo in the summer of nineteen seventy two in one of his interviews with the select committee staff rebozo also stated that it was his recollection that he received the key biscayne contribution at his home rather than at his bank office on december twentieth nineteen seventy three rebozo testified that he had received the second fifty thousand dollar contribution at his home in august nineteen seventy c initiator of first delivery 
on march twentieth nineteen seventy four mr rebozo testified before the select committee that danner had offered the fifty thousand dollar contribution to rebozo on numerous occasions after the nineteen sixty nine election however on may tenth nineteen seventy three mr rebozo told irs agents that after the nineteen sixty eight election rebozo could not remember whether he approached danner or danner approached him about making the contribution mr danner testified on tuesday december eighteenth nineteen seventy three that after the nineteen sixty eight election in early nineteen sixty nine rebozo needled danner about the fact that the hughes people had not made a substantial contribution to the nineteen sixty eight campaign danner testified that in nineteen sixty nine rebozo asked danner whether hughes would contribute funds to begin taking polls on candidates for the nineteen seventy congressional elections danner also testified that this occurred after rebozo had refused danner's offer in early nineteen sixty nine to deliver the fifty thousand dollar contribution that had been promised for the nineteen sixty eight campaign d purpose of the money on march twentieth nineteen seventy four mr rebozo testified that the two contributions he received from richard danner were to be used for the nineteen seventy two presidential campaigns since he did not accept contributions from anybody for anything else however on june eighteenth nineteen seventy three rebozo apparently told kenneth whitaker that the money rebozo was taking out of the safe deposit box in the key biscayne bank was from howard hughes and was to be applied to the republican congressional elections in nineteen seventy in addition rebozo apparently told whitaker that a short time after receiving the first contribution he received another fifty thousand dollars from richard danner to be used for the same purpose richard danner has insisted throughout his staff interviews and his sworn testimony before the select committee that the funds he contributed on behalf of howard hughes were requested by rebozo to be used for the nineteen seventy congressional campaigns or for polls for those elections and that this was the purpose of the contributions robert mayhew has testified that the purpose of the first fifty thousand dollar contribution was to fulfill the pledge made in the nineteen sixty eight campaign and that the second contribution was made to ensure that the hughes people had an entree with the nixon administration finally richard danner testified that in march or april nineteen seventy two he received a telephone call from b b rebozo asking him if howard hughes was going to make a contribution to the nineteen seventy two campaign e individuals who had knowledge of the receipt of the hughes contribution on march twentieth nineteen seventy four b b rebozo testified under oath to the select committee that he had informed rosemary woods of the hughes contribution shortly after he received it on may tenth nineteen seventy three rebozo told internal revenue service special agents who were interviewing him that he and the two agents were the only individuals who knew about the money furthermore on july tenth nineteen seventy three rebozo told internal revenue special agent john bartlett and revenue agent bert webb that he did not notify anyone of the receipt of the money it was not until his october eighth nineteen seventy three interview with the senate select committee that rebozo testified that he told rosemary woods that he had a contribution from howard hughes totaling one hundred thousand dollars in his safe deposit box which he shared with thomas wakefield in that interview rebozo stated that he told miss woods about the contribution at about the time he became apprehensive about retaining it in addition rebozo stated in that interview that he thought that he told herb kalmbach at some point when discussing nineteen seventy two campaign contributions that he received a nineteen sixty eight contribution from howard hughes finally in that same interview rebozo recalled that he also informed president nixon about the campaign contribution from howard hughes in one of his visits at key biscayne after the nineteen seventy two election then in rebozo's interview with the senate select committee on october seventeenth nineteen seventy three rebozo stated that he did not discuss the contribution with any other individuals besides rosemary woods between the time he received it and the time when he decided to return the contribution rebozo added that he talked with several other individuals about the contribution after he had decided to return the money rebozo also testified that he talked to herbert kalmbach about the hughes contribution on april thirtieth nineteen seventy three 
then on march twentieth nineteen seventy four rebozo swore under oath before the senate select committee that president nixon had counseled rebozo to give the money back in early nineteen seventy three rebozo also testified on march twentieth nineteen seventy four that he discussed what he should do with the money with william griffin a new york lawyer and the attorney for robert aplanop furthermore rebozo testified on march twentieth nineteen seventy four that he had several discussions of the hughes contribution with rosemary woods and estimated that he discussed it with her on three or four separate occasions rebozo also stated in an interview on october seventeenth nineteen seventy three that he told miss woods that the hughes contribution was for the nineteen seventy two campaign and that he discussed the problems of the hughes organization with her miss woods testified on march twenty second nineteen seventy four i don't think we had several discussions there was nothing to discuss so far as i know in addition she testified that rebozo never offered any details with regard to the contribution and that she did not know for which campaign the contribution was intended mr rebozo also testified that he discussed the one hundred thousand dollars with thomas h wakefield after he decided to return the money in addition rebozo testified he told the president about having the hughes money sometime prior to march or april nineteen seventy three when the president visited key biscayne florida on october seventeenth nineteen seventy three rebozo told the select committee staff that after he had decided to return the money rebozo mentioned the hughes contribution to john ehrlichman and h r haldeman ehrlichman however said in a january interview that he did not know anything at all about the one hundred thousand dollar contribution until he read about it in the newspaper in the fall of nineteen seventy three ehrlichman recalled that he did discuss the general subject of hughes contributions with rebozo although he could not recall the date he recalled that rebozo told him that the hughes people had misled him into thinking that they would make a very large contribution but had ended up making a contribution very much under ten thousand dollars ehrlichman said that rebozo had indicated to him that rebozo had received only a de minimis contribution from the hughes people then on march twenty first nineteen seventy four rebozo testified that neither haldeman nor ehrlichman knew anything about the one hundred thousand dollars in nineteen seventy two or nineteen seventy three rebozo testified that they knew nothing about it to my knowledge f conditions under which the money was stored on march twentieth nineteen seventy four rebozo testified that after receiving the cash he marked h h in the corner of the envelope containing the cash wrote a letter to thomas h wakefield that was placed in the director's safe deposit box with instructions on what to do with the money should anything happen to mr rebozo marked similar instructions on the manila envelope containing the money and placed the envelope in his safe deposit box number two twenty four at the key biscayne bank however rebozo also testified that he destroyed the original envelope in which the hughes money was contained some time after the hughes problem started and the campaign got under way rebozo also testified that he destroyed the letters to wakefield in the director's box at a later time rebozo further testified that some time after he placed the hughes contribution in his safe deposit box he took the bank wrappers off of the money and placed rubber bands around the packets however on march twenty first nineteen seventy four herbert kalmbach testified that he met rebozo on january eighth nineteen seventy four and that rebozo then told him undoubtedly herb i have not told you that after you and i talked last spring regarding the hughes money i found that i had in fact not dispersed any of the hughes cash to the several people i named when i went into the safe deposit box i found that the wrappers around the cash had not been disturbed and so it was clear that no part of this money had been used in addition ken whittaker stated in an interview on november twentieth nineteen seventy three that when he observed the counting of the money on june eighteenth nineteen seventy three some of the packets were held together by rubber bands while others were in bank wrappers whittaker did not recall any identification on the wrappers mr rebozo also testified that thomas h wakefield had a duplicate key to safe deposit box number two twenty four where the money was kept during the entire time that the money was stored in a safe deposit box 
Rebozo testified that sometime during the period after he received the Hughes contribution, he lost all of his keys to his safe deposit boxes, and that the locks were changed after he lost his keys. Rebozo testified that he gained access to box number 224 on this occasion by requesting the second key from Mr. Wakefield so that Rebozo could get into the box. Rebozo also testified that he gave Wakefield the replacement key for the new lock after the new lock was installed. However, Thomas H. Wakefield, under oath before the Senate Select Committee on June 10, 1974, testified that Rebozo never came to him to request his copy of the key of the safe deposit box number 224 and that he was never given any replacement key to get into the box after the locks were allegedly changed. Wakefield stated in an interview that sometime in 1968 or 1969, Rebozo gave him a key to the safe deposit box and told him that in the case of Rebozo's death, Wakefield should open the box and follow the instructions. Rebozo also testified that it was not the custom of the bank to ask Rebozo to sign the access card each time he went into his safe deposit boxes. Therefore, the same safe deposit box records produced by Rebozo did not represent each time that he went into the box. G. Other Contributions On March 21, 1974, Rebozo testified that A.D. Davis made a $50,000 cash contribution to Rebozo on April 4th or 5th, 1972. Rebozo further testified that he called the Finance Committee to re-elect the President after receiving the contribution, and that the committee sent Fred LaRue down to pick up the money. However, Fred LaRue testified that he did not discuss any contribution with B.B. Rebozo until October 1972, and that on that occasion, LaRue called Rebozo to request contributions for the Nunn campaign in Kentucky at the request of John Mitchell. In addition, LaRue's plane ticket showing the trip during which he picked up the money from Rebozo is dated October 12, 1972. However, on December 20, 1972, Rebozo testified in a civil deposition that he received campaign funds for President Nixon's re-election campaign from January 1, 1971 through April 6, 1972, which have already been listed. It is interesting to note, however, that the A.D. Davis contribution was never noted on any list of contributors to the 1972 campaign, nor was any contribution from Davis acknowledged by Maurice Stans, the chairman of the SCRP, until October 13, 1972. Rebozo also testified that he set up a separate bank account for all contributions he received for the 1972 campaign. However, Rebozo testified before the Select Committee that he did not place the Hughes $100,000 contribution nor the A.D. Davis $50,000 in the special account that he had set up. On July 10, 1973, Rebozo told IRS Special Agent Jack Bartlett that, in 1972, Rebozo put all contributions received by him in the bank account, special bank account he set up for contributions. In addition, Mr. Rebozo also testified on December 20, 1973, that aside from the Kislak contribution and the Hughes contribution, that he received other contributions, but those were others that are reported and they are a matter of record. Rebozo added, I believe, however, that they are subsequent to the April 7th date. Then, Rebozo was asked, Q. There should be no pre-April 7, 1972 contributions that are not in the material you submitted. Is that correct? A. That's correct, to the best of my recollection. If you are getting at something specific you want to ask me about, go ahead. On March 20, 1974, Rebozo was asked if Herbert Kalmbach asked him to see any specific individual with regard to contributions for the 1972 campaign. Rebozo replied, Yes, I think that later on, I don't know whether it was 1969 or 1970, it might have been 1970, he asked me to make an appointment with him with a couple of people that I knew. One was Paul Getty and another was Raymond Guest. Rebozo also testified that the purpose of contacting these individuals was for the purpose of obtaining contributions for the 1972 election. The following exchange occurred. Mr. Lenzner, had you been asked by anybody else to speak to Mr. Getty yourself? Mr. Rebozo, no. 
Mr. Lensner, you had not been requested by anybody else to seek to obtain money from Mr. Getty? Mr. Rebozo, no. However, in a memorandum dated on February 17, 1969, from H.R. Haldeman to John Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman stated that B.B. Rebozo has been asked by the President to contact J.P. regarding major contributions. Herbert Kalmbach testified on March 21, 1974, that Rebozo had asked Kalmbach to solicit from Mr. Getty funds for the 1970 senatorial campaign program. Kalmbach also testified that Rebozo set it up for him to see Mr. Getty in Europe. On November 9, 1973, h r haldeman told the staff in an interview that he recalled that rebozo was responsible for raising funds from former senator john smathers and his friends and may have been the j p getty contact in addition rebozo testified that he sent leftover nineteen sixty eight campaign funds from the florida nixon for president committee to herb kalmbach pursuant to kalmbach's request rebozo testified that he did not know what kalmbach was going to do with the money I wasn't concerned with the purpose. He was just a little late in asking me, and I thought everything was paid. Kalmbach testified that Rebozo had a special account in Key Biscayne that had leftover 1968 campaign funds in it. Kalmbach said he asked Rebozo to send these funds to him in order to pay Caulfield and Ulasewicz. Before requesting the money from Rebozo, however, Kalmbach said he first cleared this procedure with John Ehrlichman. Kalmbach recalls that Ehrlichman approved that the funds Rebozo held from 1968 should be used to pay Caulfield and Ulasewicz. Kalmbach testified that he discussed the need for these funds with Rebozo and that Rebozo specifically knew they were for Caulfield and Ulasewicz. End of section 23.